Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast. It's the world's favorite place to go for fun, car romance, and talk. This what? is the In Wheel Time car talk show. Today coming to you from Woody's Waterfront Rod and Custom Car Show. Just ahead, another car lover is in our sights. Uh-oh. And we're going to stick the microphone on his face. <laughs> Later, Jeff has the racing calendar. Mars has this week in auto history, and I'll get you caught up on the stories making automotive news headlines this week. Howdy along with Mike out of this world, Mars, down there chatting amongst themselves. We always need more Jeff Zekin. Our chief engineer, David Ainsley, is with us today. We got him out of bed early. We have our built-in audience. That'd be uh, Jeff Heitzman. I'm Don Armstrong. Glad you could join us on this Saturday. It is simply gorgeous down here. Okay, so Galveston Bay trinity bay we're right between the two right here on the point in san leon texas and there's not a jeff's cloud gonna, in the sky and jeff's going to have a little story about the founding yeah, of san leon that's my feature today so pay okay. attention uh, all right uh, we got that coming up yeah all right mr mars uh, who do we have in the uh, hot seat you know one of these days when i grow up i am going to have a 32 you better hurry up <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> and this this particular one that we have right here now danny burroughs is here with it and he is with Bruce's, Bruce's Rod Shop. Bruce's Rod Shop. You know, if you remember, I didn't we realize had Bruce's Rod we Shop. Talked, didn't we? A few years ago, we talked to his mother at mm-hmm. Tail Pipes and Tacos. They have, she they was out there in a roadster as well. Three of them, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's out here today with this one. And I love it. Yeah. Well, what is that, a 32? Yes, sir. It's a 32, what I would call a low boy. Well, actually, that's a high boy roaster. Um, this one's a high boy. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh-huh. What, what's the difference between a high boy and a low boy? A uh, high boy roaster, the body is not channeled over the frame. A low boy roaster, the body's channeled over the frame, which makes it look, of course, lower to the ground. Ah, okay. And this so, is the high boy? Yeah, yeah high yeah. boy is basically it's on standard. Frame. It's on a standard, standard 32 Ford chassis. Um, basically, a high boy roaster um, is a basically a stock, stock appearing car that they pull the fenders and running boards off of. And so back in the, the pre-war era, um, when they were starting to build hot rods, um, or hot rods, 32s were, yep. were kind of the, the, the golden child they of were the... plentiful, and exactly, they were light. Exactly. And so basically, you could get one relatively inexpensive, and, and the racers out in Southern California, there's running out at the Dry Lakes and El Mirage, they would just pull the fenders off and... And go out there and just like you see it here. Yes, sir. Uh Now, was it it a two seater always? It's always a two seater. Yes, sir. Who bought that car back when it was new? Um, I can't can't imagine a family car. No, they they had uh, this uh, 32 was available with either a trunk car or a rumble seat car. A rumble seat. So, um, a small family, well, everybody was small back then. Uh, the average person was probably five foot four or so. That's I was. And, and so, uh, yeah, way back <laughs> yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen pictures. Then, yeah. And so, um, uh, so they, they could have had uh, the kids in the back and and uh, and then have the, the parents. In the rumble seat, so when they uh-huh. rolled it over, the kids would go flying Oh, yeah, yeah, out. yeah. Just eject them, the, and they're okay. Yeah. The rumble seat, you could get the rumble seat with the roadster? Or uh-huh. just... Yeah, you could get a rumble seat okay. with, with every um, – Two-seater body style. What was it? Uh, I, I'm just asking because I, I got to answer ask these questions as we go along here. Of course. Could you make the rumble seat after the car was already built with a trunk? Yes. This uh, this particular car, um, if I remember correctly, was a rumble seat car that we converted to a trunk car. Um, basically, the the deck lid's the same, the body's the same. Um, there's one panel that the deck lid latches to that, that bolts in and out between the two different uh, bo- uh, body styles or the two different options. And, um, and so you could, you could have a trunk car and later on decided that you wanted a rumble seat and, and basically convert it to a rumble seat car. How long have you had this car? Uh, this car, um, uh, it's been on the road since 2009. Um, we've had it for for numerous years before then. We were col- we were collecting parts for it. Um, so this uh, is your restoration. This yes, is- sir. This is this is actually my dad's roaster that uh, that me and him built together at our shop. Um, well, you have a beautiful model. That, well, thank uh, you, thank you. Uh, the, no, no, the, the model that. Oh, the model. Show. The guy that's showing you. Oh, car. okay, yeah. That guy. 
But it, I, you know, I guess the, the, I, I the, guess the model is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, he's and not a beauty to me. The prison, the prison pre-release program is one of wonders. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, that sir is Michael Wooding, sometimes known as Woody. This is his car show, and so our he can host. Do, we well, do today's whatever, with, with the can, most. You he's Woody. Whatever you want to do, if you own the show. Mm-hmm. Is that <laughs> uh, all right? So, what kind of motors it got? And it, it's not a flathead. No, no, not this one. This one, uh, 32, was the first year for a flathead, so it could have had a flathead um, from the factory. Um, this one here has actually got a small block Chevrolet in it with a five-speed. Okay, now why? See, I, I have just a little bit of an issue with that. Why there, would you put a Chevrolet motor into a Ford vehicle when there are Ford, via, Ford uh, motors available to go in that? The, uh, the easiest way to answer that is they fit better. In, in between the firewall and the radiator than a Ford does because of the, the architecture of, of a Ford motor is long in the front. Um, and so, which means that to have enough room for electric fan and radiator and accessories that the motor has to be moved back in the chassis, which encroaches into your foot room in the car. So that's, that's a simple way of saying it. Or you could put a Ford four-banger in there. Well, they, they, uh, they had that... F- uh, from the factory, um, you could either get uh, 32 was um, kind of the the biggest transition year because, uh, of course, Ford came out with the, the V8 in that year. Um, uh, and they were basically during those year ranges, Chevrolet was, was kicking their tails on sales because of the inline six. Um, that was uh, uh, a good, good power plan in the Chevrolet models back then. But then, again, the same issue holds true you can't put a straight six in it because it's too long exactly yeah and so uh so the v8 platform um uh from ford uh, uh in the flathead uh gave them the the more cubic inches and the more power uh in a in a relatively small compact size see i'm thinking right now the first thing that comes to my mind something that's small of course if you can't hot rod it too much but uh the turbocharged buick v6 mm-hmm. would that would fit I, yeah some, we we something. actually uh several years back we built a 27 roaster for a customer that had a a, a turbocharged v6 in it and um we tried to convince the the customer that was the first v6 turbocharged motor that we had worked on and uh, uh putting it into a hot rod and so we tried to convince the customer man we could we could put a small block in this thing and it worked great and have good power. And he's like, no, oh, this is this is the power this plant that I, I want to run. This is what I want. And so sometimes uh, the customer is right. And, um, well, and yeah. so you get. Yeah, uh, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes the customer is right. And so we put that in there. And, and the first opportunity that I got to drive the car uh, when we when we got on the road, I, um, I had my own roaster at the time that had about a 400 horsepower small block in it. And um, and so I was very familiar on what that car felt like with that power range, and this motor was built and it had a similar power range, and and so I got out and and kind of put my foot in it and and it's like this piece of junk and then that, that turbo <laughs> spooled up. Kick? Oh, it, it it kicked like a mule and took off and and all you could hear is just rushing wind uh, from the turbo and the and the wind uh, being an open car and that. That was the moment that, that a, a turbocharged, small cubic inch, small displacement motor gave me the respect. Now, and, let, me, um, let, me, let me take that one step further. So, how much reliable horsepower can you get out of a flathead V8, say, for instance, a 32? Well, an, an original 32. No, not the original. I know, I'm a, but the original architecture of a 32 motor, um, the types of bearings that they use is is not a good platform to to make power out of um didn't they the, modify those though in later years yes and, later years um basically uh, so you know i guess what i'm saying is yeah. you could worse come to worse put a flathead v8 same style same looking motor that it came with yeah but with updated internals and maybe a, you know a carburetor or whatever yeah you could get reliably um and probably probably these days the, the parts availability for a flathead is probably the greatest that has ever been in history. Yeah. Um, what kind of horsepower do you think you could get out of it? At least I've seen 
I've seen in the mid 200s. I was going to say 250. Which is um, an original 32 was 85 horse motor. But dude, the cars done. There's yeah, no does. car there. It's just a, basically an engine with a frame and some yeah. and some steel around it. Oh my God! They'll let anybody in here, even the locals. Exactly. Yeah. He's yeah. a local. Yeah. If he's driving a, a Ford convertible, he can. Yeah. Well, not that one. No, it's not. <laughs> Tim Spell has uh, decided to uh, adorn us with his presence today. All right, so let's go back and, and continue on. So do they make wiring harnesses for the small block Chevy for that car? Um, you have to make it yourself. Basically, we start out with a universal wiring harness, and then uh, that basically gives us uh, a 12. Everything you need. It gives us everything we need. and, and uh, these, With some wires left over. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. These these cars um, are uh, relatively uh, simple designs. Yeah. Um, this car doesn't have a radio. This car doesn't have uh, AC. It's it a does. radio delete? It's a radio delete. Is it yeah. got a heater delete, it, too? No, it's got, it actually has a heater in it. Yeah. We, we put a heater in this car just for... Uh, Was it 38 Special? Is that the heater? No, it's actually... This has a, a vintage, air, vintage air heater under the dash. Okay. And, and so... But it does it does have um, uh, the, the 270 AC in it. Two windows down, seventy, 70 miles, miles an hour. An hour yeah. 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 <laughs> and so, um, uh, so it, it's uh, it. Do you have a top for it? Yes, sir. That that car actually has a top. Um, it's a it's a cloth folding top. So it's basically. more like a convertible. Did you buy it, it off the shelf, or did you have it made? Um, we bought the irons, and we had the the Hearts canvas put on it. Um, uh, when we first built this car, um, we bought a top and irons kit from a company called the Baron Bonnie, which um, uh, has since. Uh, closed down, but they they make or they made at that time restoration kits for upholstery and and tops for different yeah. different brands and models of cars. What and kind so, of transmission has got in it? Uh, that's got a Tremec TKO uh, five speed. That's a uh, manual transmission. <laughs> manual transmission. Why did you decide to go to a manual transmission? Uh, because hot rods are supposed to have three pedals. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> there you that, go. That, that, and and small block Chevrolets. That's a fair enough answer. I got it. <laughs> I, but I know that uh, they make uh, some really good three-speed automatics yeah. that w- would be able to take the horsepower. How much horsepower do you think it's got? Uh, that's got a ZZ430 crate motor from Chevrolet, so it's got 430 horse, 430 torque. That that thing would burn the tires Launch. off the back. It works It works really well. That's That car, um, the last time we weighed the car, it was uh, 2,618 pounds. <laughs> and so, um, so the power-to-weight ratio so works really well on that about car. About two horsepower per pound. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, do you do this for a living? I do. Yes, sir. What's the name of your shop? Bruce's Rod Shop. We're Bruce's in, Rod Shop. We're in Spring, Texas. Uh, this coming January will be our 44th year for being in business. Uh, Dad started the company um, in '81, uh, and um, uh, this past June, I've been doing it 36 years, uh, working with Dad side by side, and and, um, and it was a family event. Family, because, family, yes, sir. Uh-huh. When we first talked to y'all out at uh, Tailpipes and Tacos a couple mm-hmm. of three years ago, yeah. Your mom was there. She was driving one. Exactly. Yeah. Your she dad, had you. I get. I think uh-huh. I yeah. You it was. Um, uh, we came out to Tell Pipes and Tacos out at, at uh, Loopy Tortillas mm-hmm. and and um, the right outside of Katy area. Right. Um, and so, uh, mom brought her red roaster out. My wife brought her black roaster out. I brought my coupe out. Uh, Dad brought his green roaster out. And um, you swamped the place. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, our goal is to bring the show whenever we come. So, um, it's Are the rest of the family here. Bring the show. Uh, with you? Uh, my son and his wife Giselle. They're they're watching uh, from the grandstands over here. Gotcha. Um, myself is here, of course, and my dad drove uh, another one of our cars, and so and you drove him here. Was that your yes, dad sir. who I talked to first? Yes. Sir. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. That's that's Bruce, and I'm Bruce Jr. Um, and so, um, uh, I've. Me and uh, my wife. My wife uh, runs the office, and and I I run herd on the rest of the the uh, the guys in the shop, and and uh, I have my my clientele that I work on, and and uh, so and then dad's dad's retired and and living living his best life now. Living the dream. Yeah, living the dream. Being able to to come into the shop and and uh, only worry about the stuff that he wants to worry about, and and. Uh, and play play with his cars when he wants to play with his cars. What are cars. you working on right Good now in the him. shop? Uh, we have uh, we have a plethora of stuff going on right now. Um, uh, we have a couple of '57 Chevrolets. We have a couple of '32 Fords that we're working on for customers. Uh, we have um, 
We have a, a Jeep project that we're working on. We have a 72 So you don't work laser. just on 32s. If it, if it was solely up to me, that's what I would work on yeah. because that's what I'm passionate about. Um, uh, our industry runs in cycles. And so um, it's what cycle is this? Is this the rinse cycle? The the cycle right now is is muscle cars and, and classic trucks. Um, what I've what I've noticed over the years is I've I've worked on worked on cars for uh, older generation, uh, and then you have my generation, and they have a little bit younger generation. Talk about my and, generation. And so yeah, of course. And so um, uh, the it seems like the older generation likes the hot rods. Uh, the children of that generation likes muscle cars, and the grandchildren of the, of the first generation like what their grandparents were into. So they're so it, it, you, I've I've had the opportunity to be in it long enough where I've watched the cycles go and come, and and um, and so you're old. I am. I am. Yeah. I feel. Because <laughs> that, no. that's what he's I'm here. He's old. That's what you tell. <laughs> I'm looking for some help here. With yeah. You. Okay. All right. Well, now now that I know, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll give you a little. Are you little are you support. bringing some cars down there to? Uh, uh, Gears and Grub show down in Friendswood. Um, I I'll probably there's have the to, guy right yeah, there. I, I, I he sent me a flyer. I, I need to, or he gave me a flyer, so I need to see if it, yeah you need to go if it if it works into my schedule because you got a couple shows out of town coming up. But um, uh, but yeah, it sounds sounds like fun. We have we have friends that live down towards Friendswood, and and they have um, uh, their own personal shops in the in the garages uh, community down there that we've we've gone to their coffee and cars deals. And so it's, it's uh, oh, kind um, of support the area. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, we're, we sure appreciate you stopping by and talking well, to us. Pleasure. Beautiful car. Thanks well, thank for you. showing it to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, the Inwell Time Car Talk show is available 24-7 through the iHeartRadio app. Just look for Inwell Time Car Talk. We also video stream on Facebook, YouTube, at InWillTime.com. And podcasts are available from your favorite podcast provider. The Inwell Time Car Talk show continues right after this quick break. The original group of Lupi Tortilla restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipe means when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the first Lupi Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here is the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Lupi Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Lupi Tortilla award-winning beef fajitas the best anywhere. Lupi Tortilla Katie's and other location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located on 99, the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggieland? Head to the Loopy Tortilla in College Station. Located just around the corner from Kyle Field, it's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Going to Louisiana? The Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont is on I-10, so you can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants has the best Tex-Mex anywhere, and you're invited anytime. Your car is a direct reflection of you, so don't be satisfied with color fade or a dingy, dull appearance. Get rid of those terrible automated car wash scratches. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your save-the-paint company. John Gray and his team of detailing experts can help your cars finish without a full repaint. Searching for the real experts in window tint or windshield protection? Gulf Coast Auto Shield. Dash cams, radar detectors, Gulf Coast Auto Shield. Got a new car? Get that thing protected as soon as you take delivery. If you don't know which of the multitude of protection products to go with, John Gray will give you an honest opinion and won't sell you something you don't need or can't afford. John will help you understand the many options and pricing right on the spot. He's your guy to have your ride looking its best and protected, too. See the state-of-the-art shop yourself. Free tours anytime. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is easy to get to. Located just south of the Southwest Freeway on the Sam Houston Parkway. Gulf Coast Auto Shield. Full service luxury car care today. And online at gcautoshield.com. Today's In Wheel Time Car Talk Show is coming to you live from Woody's Waterfront Rod and Custom Car Show at the Top Water Grill down here in San Leon, Texas. Thank you for riding with us today. Time now for the racing calendar, sponsored by Texas Muscle Car Club Challenge. Yeah, we got IMSOs coming up in October, so we've got a couple more weeks for those folks to be uh, handling their race challenges. Sports cars. Sports cars, yeah, IMSO. So uh, we've got Kansas Speedway. Uh-oh, mic drop stuff. Kansas Speedway is tomorrow. Uh, for the NASCAR boys, and then you got NHRA, the Midwest Nationals, coming up tomorrow out of St. Louis. Formula One, well, those folks are off until October, middle of October, October 18th. And I know and so you're on. happy. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. So this week in auto history. Yeah, go for it. 
September the 17th, 1901. It was the debut of the Oldsmobile Curve Dash. Now, this may not sound like too big a deal, but it became the first mass-produced car in the U.S. It's, there's a difference between mass-produced and being the one that was done uh, like Henry Ford did on his line. So it became a pivotal event in automotive production history. The gasoline-powered Oldsmobile Model R was built on an assembly line using interchangeable parts, which is what made it different than just what Henry Ford was doing. It was introduced by the Oldsmobile Company in 1901 and produced from 1903, and there was 19,000 overall were built. Then, coming up in September the 21st, 1893, was the first gasoline-powered car in America. Charles and Frank Durier road-tested the first gasoline-powered car in the U.S. on the streets of Springfield, Massachusetts. That initial drive came to a sudden halt when, after just a few hundred feet, their self-engineered transmission failed. Frank made a slight adjustment to design, had the car back up and running, and covered a half mile Good. later in the day. It's regarded as the first time an American manufactured gasoline-powered car was driven in the country. Then, in September the 23rd, 1969, the Dodge Challenger hit the market. It was the late 1960s. The muscle car craze was sweeping the United States. Dodge tossed a new Challenger in the ring. The Dodge Challenger, which made a market debut, debut on September 23, 1969, was the 1970 model, was a direct response to the competition from the other automakers such as Ford Mustang and Chevrolet Camaro. It was muscular, aggressive looking, had lots of choices in engines from a straight six to a big block 440 and even a 426 Hemi. 1969, September the 23rd, the Triumph Spitfire Mark launch. Now this was important because this was the British manufacturer Triumph launched the Mark IV Spitfire, became an iconic model in the sports car world. The Mark IV featured a redesigned rear similar to the Triumph Stag and the Triumph 2000 models. Front end was revised with a new bonnet and so that the top of the, the wings, the door... The Have you read for a while or is this a... Yes, I'm thinking about something else unfortunately. So the hood was welded down the top so that the hood opened like with the wings on it, the door handles were recessed, and the convertible top got squared off co corners. Anyway, this had a free Take full that drink away from him. Width Take dashboard. <laughs> the instrumentation was ahead of the driver instead of on the center of the dash, as had previously been done. And it had a lot of black plastic that we talked about earlier. In 1973, it was finished in wood. It had a 79.1 cubic inch engine throughout the entire production run. Beautiful. And that was the events this week in automotive history that well, stood out. All right. Whew. Yeah, buddy. It was tough. <clears throat> Here's one for you, Mars. This is right up your alley. The Chrysler yeah. Voyager minivan. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's returning to the retail lineup for the 2025 model year. After several years, is a fleet-only option. The Voyager will serve as the entry point to the brand's minivan lineup that includes the gasoline-powered Pacifica and the Pacifica plug-in hybrid. The Voyager starts at forty-one six ninety. So why are they building it if it's going to cost that much? I don't. I don't understand. Fleet sales. No, no. They're going to start selling it again to the public. Oh, to the public. But it starts at forty-one six ninety with shipping, three hundred and fifty dollars more than the base twenty twenty-four Pacifica. That makes no sense to me. No, that it had to be really nice to beat out the, the Voyager Pacifica. nameplate has roots dating back 40 years. Plymouth Voyager, one of two minivans, along with the Dodge Caravan, launched in 1984. I'm sorry. I, I don't even know why I brought that story. Forget <laughs> it. <laughs> Neither we. I don't know why. Mm -mm -mm. Stupid. Nissan won the first round in its long brewing boat battle with former chairman Carlos. I call him Gosen. I think it's pronounced Gon. At Moan about who rightfully owns the indicted fugitive super yacht with a court ruling Gone illicitly siphoned millions from the car maker to buy the 121 foot pleasure cruiser. Have you ever seen it? Oh my god, it's unbelievable. Gone was ordered to give up the vessel to Nissan Motor Company while he and his wife and a company they created as a vehicle to purchase the yacht were ordered to pay $32 million in damages, according to the ruling by the British Virgin Islands High Court. The custom line Nevada 37 yacht, built by the Italian boat maker Ferretti, was christened Sachu. God Jap bless you. Japanese for the boss. The boat builder's company catalog listed the model as having seven bathrooms, five main cabins, and four cabins for the crew. 
The yacht became a symbol of the alleged self-serving excesses at the crux of misconduct accusations against Ghosn, who was arrested in 2018 at the height of his power as chairman of the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi Alliance, then the world's biggest automotive group. Way to go, Ghosn. There you go, buddy. Moron. <laughs> My property is 105 foot deep. That boat's longer than your property. Yeah. How many bathrooms do you have? I get tired have? of walking from the front to the back. Of the yard. You how, know, many, you, how many bathrooms you, do you have on your property? Is, is this a math test today? No, I'm just imagining how big this stupid boat is. <clears throat> it's Political, right out there. It's Political here. uncertainty in the U.S. and Canada creating concern for the auto industry as the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement approaches its scheduled review in 2026. Under the terms of the trade pact, which it dictates how vehicles and parts can move across borders without tariffs, the three countries must confirm in writing by July 1st, 2026, whether they want to continue the deal. Okay. United States, Canada, Mexico. There's that. That's upcoming. More to worry about. Let's not forget about the dock strike that's impending. Yeah. It's going to affect everybody in everything. If they shut down the dock workers all the way from New England, all the way down the eastern seaboard, right over here to the Gulf of Mexico and down to Mexico. Mm-mm-mm. Okay. See, now you need that big yacht. <laughs> Apparently so. We can all get on it and disappear. And uh, Toyota Motor Chairman Akio Toyota confirmed September 26th that the company will not renew its 10-year contract as a top sponsor for the Olympics and Paralympics following the Paris Games. International Olympic Committee saw revenues of $2.295 billion wow. from its top sponsors for the period 2017 to 21, the second biggest source of income for the Olympic movement, with broadcasters paying $4.544 billion over the same period of time. No wonder our business is going broke. Mm-mm-mm. Just saying. Just a couple of We'd things. love to hear from you. Just shoot us an email. The address here is info. At InWheelTime.com. Time now for a quick break. You're on the In Wheel Time Car Talk Show. Pro-Am Auto Accessories has been serving Houston's auto enthusiasts since 1984, providing world-class products for sports cars, European sedans, and American muscle. Pro-Am is known as the place to go to find exclusive and hard-to-find parts and accessories. Pro-Am is one of the very first distributors in the USA for brands such as Recaro, Redline, Momo, Corbo, and Simpson. Located in the heart of Houston's premier retail and service corridor, the Galleria area, Pro-Am's walk-in storefront includes an 8,000-square-foot warehouse, showroom, and installation bays. Pro-Am not only sells parts and accessories, but also offers installation and service. Pro-Am is now reaching a worldwide audience through Pro-Am.com, taking its local reputation to the rest of the world. At Pro-Am Auto, you'll be dealing with a small group of professionals who truly want to help you with your automotive needs. If you don't see what you're looking for on the website, call and Pro-Am will lend you a hand. Pro-Am Auto, 6125 Richmond at Green Ridge in Houston's Galleria area. Call them at 713-781-7755. The annual Time Fall Tour begins Saturday, September 28th at Woody's 6th Annual Waterfront Rod and Custom Car Show. There'll be awards for Best Truck, Rat Rod, Import, Paint, Engine, Interior, and Best of Show. It happens at the Topwater Grill in San Leon, Texas, where the backdrop of Galveston Bay will be one for your car scrapbook. Registration is $30 per car on site. Visitors are free 8 to 4, Saturday, September 28th. It's Woody's 6th Annual Waterfront Rod and Custom Car Show at Topwater Grill in San Leon, Texas. The Inwell Time Fall Remote Tour continues Saturday, October 12th from 8.30 to 3 at the Good Grub and Gears Car Show and Fall Festival, hosted by the Space City Corvette Club. See up to 300 cars under the trees in beautiful Stevenson Park in Friendswood. Competitors register online. Proceeds benefit Texas EquiSearch. Showgoers are free and will see all makes and models of the finest rides at this judged event. It's Saturday, October 12th, 8.30 to 3 at the Good Grub and Gears Car Show and Fall Festival in Stevenson Park in Friendswood. Sponsored by Emmons Autoplex on FM 528 near the Gulf Freeway and Webster. The In Wheel Time Fall Remote Tour continues Saturday, October 12th from 8.30 to 3 at the Good Grub and Gears Car Show and Fall Festival hosted by the Space City Corvette Club. See up to 300 cars under the trees in beautiful Stevenson Park in Friendswood. Competitors register online. Proceeds benefit Texas EquiSearch. Showgoers are free and will see all makes and models of the finest rides around at this judged event. It's Saturday, October 12th, 8.30 to 3 at the Good Grub and Gears Car Show and Fall Festival at Stevenson Park in Friendswood. The In Wheel Time broadcast is sponsored by Emmons Autoplex on FM 528 near the Gulf Freeway in Webster. 
That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Podcast, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Keep listening, and we'll see you soon.